Welcome to our modernization mini series. Hey, we're uh, really excited to cover some great content with you over the next five webinars. Our goal for each one of these webinars is to keep the content to 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, we want everything to be easy to consume, easy to follow, and be really business outcome oriented. So I'll take a moment here to just break down uh, the five different webinars we'll be covering over the next five weeks. In part one, our goal is to help provide better visibility into how you can reduce risk by uh, modernizing your core control assets like PLCs as well as uh, HMIs. In part two, we'll then transition into uh, building out uh, networking fundamentals and so if you think about a modern control system, those assets should be connected. But more importantly, not only are they connected, but they're also connected with control system security as uh, top of mind. In part three, we'll then transition into intelligent devices. And by that, we mean uh, the devices that connect into your modern PLCs. So we want to uh, reduce risk and provide insights into what those smart devices can help you accomplish. In part four, uh, we want to uh, get focused on visualizing actionable information. Uh, again, thinking about a modern control system and what you should expect from uh, these types of systems are really automated diagnostics. So we're gonna drill down and provide insights into what types of diagnostics you should expect and how those diagnostics will help drive out uh, uh, downtime as well as increase system availability. And then finally, we want to help you increase productivity. So we all, want to, we all want to make more and do more with our time. And in this final session, we will provide detail about uh, flexibility, how you can extend your control systems with mobility, and then finally uh, optimize that control system. So the format for the webinar is really going to be uh, uh, chat in your questions if, if you do have them. Uh, our moderators will do their best to answer questions as they come in. Uh, and we will have roughly 10 to 15 minutes left at the end of each one of these webinars to answer questions uh, live. So if you'd like to um, tune in over the next five weeks, please do so. Uh, please make sure you're registered for each session. Uh, if you're not able to make make each each section, just be aware that uh, everything's going to be recorded. You'll be able to consume this information at your own convenience and at your own time. So without uh, further ado, let's just jump into part one. And again, here we're going to be really focused on reducing risk and providing detail about how you can go about appropriately planning your modernization strategy. Before we do that though, we do wanna take a moment to just acknowledge and uh, help, rec help you recognize the potential value of a smart connected system. And if you think about the, the challenges we've faced uh, over the last 18 months, I think a, a lot of us were working through not only uh, a, a very difficult time, both personally and professionally, but our supply chain was impacted in a lot of ways uh, significantly due to COVID. So in a modern connected enterprise, what you should expect is the ability to get better detail and insights and actionable information from your control system, make more informed decisions at headquarters, about what should be produced where and what to expect from each one of your facilities. And then really important in a connected enterprise is the ability to then share that level of detail with your customers. So the end game here is really getting your shop floor connected to the top floor and driving more throughput and value through your entire supply chain. We'll take a moment here to also define what a smart connected system is and what it's made up of. So core to a smart connected system are smart devices. A smart device is really any device that has uh, a 
processor as well as potentially the ability to communicate over a variety of protocols. For, for Rockwell Automation, that protocol is primarily Ethernet IP, uh, but we also have the ability to leverage technologies like you know, IO link and uh, heart processing capabilities or protocols. So you know, just know that a smart device is self-aware and can provide visibility into what it will be doing and why it will be doing what it's doing. Uh, in addition to that, we've also got these different components that make up a smart connected system like you know, the ability to mobilize and visualize information where you need it, when you need it. Also uh, capturing analytics about the control system and what's happening as well as using that information to better manage your control processes. One way that we can accomplish uh, a lot of these different challenges is by leveraging uh, technology like scalable computing. So for Rockwell, we have the ability to not only provide computing directly in the control chassis itself or the PLC itself, but you know, we can also complement that technology with the ability to compute on the edge or even push edge-based information to an on-prem solution or even up to the cloud. Uh, and then another component that makes up a smart connected system that is absolutely critical is your network. So if you think about a network and what's required from a network is uptime, uh, you know, greater connectivity to more assets than ever, Right, and, and one of the challenges we're all faced with is maintaining a secure network. So we'll, we'll cover those topics here over the next five weeks as well. And then finally, we want to really integrate all of this information throughout the control system and provide that information and more importantly, actionable information for uh, the right resources to use at the right time. So hopefully this helps you understand a little bit more about you know, what a smart connected system is over the next five weeks, we're gonna define what you should expect out of this smart connected system. Uh, another thing to really kind of think about and, and leverage here as we cover content, our goal was to really make sure that we were tying these modern assets back to uh, different values that you should expect uh, from the system itself. So if modernization is executed well, uh, Modernization can be simple, can be cost effective, it can also help reduce risk. Uh, we can also get greater system security and connectivity between multiple assets or across the entire plant floor. We can drive out uh, the complexity of troubleshooting and also provide automated diagnostics to you know, better increase availability of different assets. And then finally, uh, we'll, we'll make sure to tie back to increasing the flexibility of your control system as well as the mobility of your control system to drive greater productivity across not only your operators but also uh, the maintenance team. Now I'd like to just transition into a little bit more of the content specific to our uh, topic here today and if we think about a lot of control systems across uh, the manufacturing plant floor, they're most likely made up of a mix of, you know, not only new assets, I think a lot of people have already started to make this journey towards modernizing, but there are still a lot of legacy and disparate outdated devices across the plant floor. And really the challenge that is, uh, that we're faced with, with those legacy devices is that we really can't get as much useful data out of those assets as quickly as we can as new assets. Uh, they may not even be able to be as connected as many new assets are. And then finally, that uh, really means that we have less visibility into what's happening in those assets or in that given manufacturing uh, area or process itself. So uh, one of the ways that we can reduce the, the, the risk that's associated with that limited visibility and connectivity is you know, putting a plan in place. So we've got three different steps that you can leverage as a manufacturer or as a machine builder or as a system integrator. And the first one is going to be identifying where gaps exist 
in that system today. And one of the best ways we can do this, I'll, I'll cover this in the following slide, but is to leverage a service that our distributors offer, and that's called a install base evaluation. Uh, so after that install base evaluation is completed, or you have uh, manually identified gaps that exist from a risk perspective, um, you would then transition into prioritizing what changes need to be made where based on uh, maybe the risk itself or the availability of replacement products. Uh, there's a combination of different things that may drive the priority, but uh, you would definitely want to prioritize where to start uh, to then lay in step three a better foundation for uh, getting those assets or replacement assets connected. So again, here I, I mentioned uh, this service that our channel partners and distributors can provide, uh, and that is called an install base evaluation. So essentially, we would come to site, our distributor would come to site, they would work with you uh, to open panels that have uh, assets that you believe should be captured uh, from a informational perspective, and we would work to then generate a install base evaluation list that provides detail about the life cycle status of each one of those assets, the availability of replacement assets, even provide detail about suggested replacements that may work for um, that specific uh, product itself. And then you could use that information that's captured to uh, better prioritize where you should begin this modernization strategy and journey. So speaking of life, life cycle status, now the focus here of our session today is tied back to controllers as well as software. So this slide speaks to not only the different life cycle statuses that Rockwell maintains, but also the status of each one of the different assets that may exist in your control system today. So I'm just gonna speak momentarily to what each one of these different uh, life cycle states mean to you as a, as a manufacturer or user of our hardware. But um, on the far left, we've got the active life cycle state. So what that means is that you should expect many years of support and many years is typically 10 to 20 years ideally um, <clears throat> that is the most recent product released with the most up-to-date features for that product specifically. Uh, a product will transition into an active mature state when there's roughly five years left of availability of that product. It also is transitioned into that state because there is a newer, better replacement for that product available uh, from Rockwell today. A product will then move to an end-of-life state when there's roughly 12 to 24 months of uh, new product availability left for that product specifically. And this is an important state because you know, this, we're, we're essentially attempting to give you a heads up as to you know, when a modernization plan should be put in place. 12 to 24 months is typically a pretty good window uh, to plan appropriately. So if you have assets that exist in this state today, this is a really great chance to uh, start building out that strategy. And then finally, uh, we've got a state called discontinued. And what this means is that products are no longer available as new with warranty from Rock Automation, but we do have the ability to potentially service those assets based on uh, replacement products that are available uh, through our remanufacturing process. So as you can see, you know, we've got a lot of different products here in, different, in a variety of states. On the far left, uh, that is lowest risk, right? And that's made up of our control logics and compact logics family, as well as the micro logics and micro 800 processors. On the far right are what many people have uh, come to know and love and uh, appreciate from Alan Bradley and Rock Automation, and that's our the legacy PLC5, Slick 500s, some of our old microprocessors. So again, if, if uh, you see something that you're using today that is on the right side of the screen, then we would definitely want to help prioritize uh, those products for modernization. So in the next couple slides, I'll actually provide some detail about 
what products can be migrated to or modernized to um, a, a new replacement product for those legacy assets. In this case, we'll start with the microprocessors. So if you're using uh, Micrologix 1000 up to a 1500, you have two different paths you can take. So the Micro 800 is the formal replacement for the Micrologix family. What's great about this platform is that it's low cost. It also has a, a no cost development environment. So if you wanted to start testing some of these applications today, you could make that move with uh, very little risk on your part. If though you are using, say for uh, example, the Micrologix 1500, you could move to the Compact Logix 5370. The reason that you may consider making that move is if you need maybe a little bit more horsepower, if you like the Studio 5000 programming environment, or <clears throat> if you wanted to retain the existing Micrologix 1500 IO, you could technically pair that with a Compact Logix L2 or L3 processor and uh, not have to re-terminate anything in the field. Uh, in the mid-range architecture or you know, kind of the more uh, OEM-centric, single skid, maybe multiple, multiple skids, potentially based on horsepower uh, type processors, you know, we have the legacy Compact Logix as well as the uh, old Slick 500 processors in two different or three different life cycle states. The, really the natural migration path for either one of these families is the uh, Compact Logix 5380. So we'll speak a little bit more about exactly why that is and what value sh you should expect from making that move, but the 5380 is our most current platform for Compact Logix, and there's uh, some compelling reasons to consider leveraging that platform versus others. And then on the advanced architecture processors, we can we would suggest making the move from uh, 5560 or a PLC5 to the, the active lifecycle state uh, control logics processors like the L7 or the L8 processor, which uh, provide much more horsepower as well as um, uh, a modern manufacturer or a modern software platform like Studio 5000. So um, again, got a couple of different reasons as to why you might consider making those moves and the outcomes you should expect by leveraging uh, modern control hardware. So on the far left, we've got the Micro 800. If you think about uh, a new controller and some of the demands that are placed on uh, new controllers, you know, as control systems grow or change, sometimes the, the IO needs to be changed as well. So we've got the ability to customize the base module with plug-in modules, uh, as well as expand the IO for uh, enhanced applications or changes to those applications in the future. Uh, we also can leverage pre-developed application sample code or even the embedded code simulator to reduce engineering time if leveraging the Micro 800. And then the Compact Logix 5380 and the 5580 are both very similar. Uh, they, they use the same chipset, just in two different form factors. So the outcomes for both of those families are very similar in that you know, we're leveraging one gigabit ethernet ports, uh, which increase uh, the speed of connectivity to those assets, as well as provide in the Compact Logix, specifically the ability to support uh, two different IP addresses, which has been asked for for a long time. Uh, in addition to that, we've, because of that higher performing chipset, where customers have given us feedback that they've been able to capture additional throughput through their manufacturing processes because of the faster scan times. And then finally, from a flexibility and scalability perspective, in both families of these processors, we have either SIL2 or SIL3 safety rated processors if desired, as well as the ability to support up to 32 axes for compact logics or 256 axes of SIP motion um, drives. Uh, so extremely scalable, as well as uh, high performance oriented uh, processors. 
So we'll talk now a little bit about some of the tools that we have uh, available at no cost to you to take advantage of embedded in our um, modern control software. So on the left side of the screen, if you have an existing MicroLogix application, you can embed uh, or import rather the uh, existing control program into the control programming environment for the Micro 800, which is called Connected Components Workbench. And that conversion is handled automatically uh, through the import process to the Micro 800. And similar to the Micro 800 in the Compact Logix family of processors, if you were moving a Micro Logix or RS Logix 500 application, so whether that's a Slick or Micro Logix, we can also automatically convert that code directly in Studio 5000 and uh, reduce the amount of time required to rebuild that application in a, in a new platform. We also have a really uh, helpful tool called Integrated Architecture Builder. And in this environment, you would take the existing hardware, um, build that out in Integrated Architecture Builder, and then select the migration path that you would like to leverage. So by doing this, we are ensuring that the correct I.O. is uh, used for replacing the legacy I.O. and also uh, automatically building a bill of material for you to, you know, to use for planning purposes or to provide to your distributor to get a uh, to generate a cost for what you know, moving towards a new control system um, may require. In addition to those tools, uh, from a software perspective, we also have some really handy uh, hardware solutions. So I'm gonna play this video on the left, just as an example, since both of these uh, are essentially accomplishing the same task, and that is to maintain the field-based terminations in existing legacy hardware and move those terminations to a modern platform. So in this case, we'll speak specifically to the PLC5 to Control Logics IO wiring conversion tool. Uh, so imagine, as you probably have already today, an existing PLC5 rack. You would remove the terminal blocks from that PLC5 chassis, remove the chassis itself, and replace the chassis with the swing arm conversion base, and then mount the new terminal block uh, mounting blocks to that chassis and then terminate or plug in the terminal blocks to those new uh, blocks themselves and then mount the new control logics processor to the front of the swing arm install the replacement IO and then install the the swing arm wiring adapters from the legacy terminations to the new Control Logics IO. So this is all about driving out risk as well as reducing time in the field. As you can see on the bottom, uh, we, we're, we've captured some feedback from customers, but they've typically saved 10 hours uh, per rack of 10 40 point IO modules. So that's a significant amount of time, especially if you have a large project or a large application to move. Uh, we do, again, also have the same conversion hardware available for Slick 500s. Uh, so if you're interested, I've got a link here that will play that video, uh, but that would be moving to the new 5380 processor and 5069 I.O. And then from a resource perspective, we've got a couple different ways to reduce risk. Uh, so we would want to first identify risk. I mentioned this earlier. That would be done through a life cycle uh, state analysis, and that's uh, captured in an install base evaluation. So it's a really great way to assess where your risk exists today. And then to mitigate that risk, we would suggest leveraging a service contract that's designed to maximize the life of the discontinued plant floor automation hardware. Uh, so that's called a life cycle extension agreement. If you'd like to explore that, reach out to your distributor uh, uh, services specialist, and then to further drive out risk or even to potentially eliminate risk, 
Uh, if you don't have the resources on staff, we do have the ability to augment uh, your team with um, some of our field service engineers so we can put a migration service plan in place and come to site and replace hardware as well as software for you uh, specifically. And then, you know, not only are have we provided a handful of different resources and tools uh, and services that can help you in this journey, but we also want to um, remind you that we do have a commercial program in place that you can take advantage of. So you know, just because this hardware is old and is no longer considered modern, uh, it does still have value. So you can work with your local distributor to identify exactly how much value these assets have, and that can be applied as a credit towards an investment in a new technology like the 5380 processor and the IO that we referenced earlier. So moving from hardware into software modernization, we'll uh, speak to a couple of different slides here that will provide detail about moving from a legacy RS View 32 application. So there's three different steps to modernize that View 32 application to the new uh, HMI environment called Factory Talk View Site Edition. Uh, so there's Again, in these three steps, you would start with preparation. So I've got a slide here that will follow up and provide detail about the components of the Factory Talk View SE system. Uh, you would then want to, with help from our documentation, evaluate your application and what will or won't modernize. There's a couple of constraints there, um, but not many. And uh, finally, you would want to back up your existing application just in case something doesn't go the way that uh, you're expecting it to. Next, we'd move towards uh, modernization. So we've got some utilities that are included with Factory Talk View SE that would, one, convert the existing HMI tag database to a usable format for View SE, which is uh, SQL Express. You would then create a new application in Factory Talk View, and then you would import that existing View32 application uh, into View Studio and View Studio would handle the conversion to Factory Talk View SE. Finally, you would then wrap up with uh, you know, verifying that the conversion was done as you expected. You would configure communications, uh, so making sure that PLCs are connected to this new HMI system, uh, complete the migration of different system components using some of the conversion tools I'll cover in the next slide, and then test your application before deploying it. So some of those components uh, that you should be aware of that I referenced earlier, you know, there's essentially three different things here I'd like to cover. So from a development perspective, you were probably previously using View32 Works, which is what was used to maintain your View32 app. Uh, the replacement for View32 Works will be what's called Factory Talk View Studio Enterprise. Um, now there's two different flavors of View32 for runtime. So the primary one that most people use is what's uh, just considered or called the View32 runtime. And the direct replacement for that would be a like for like single runtime, which is called View SE Station. Now, if though you wanted to move to a more distributed runtime or if you were using an active display server, then you would move to Factory Talk View SE server and uh, connect multiple clients to that server to get a, a truly distributed architecture. Some of the tools and utilities I, I referenced uh, two slides ago, and we'll just touch on these from a high level. There is the legacy tag database conversion utility. This is installed with all recent versions of Factory Talk View. And what that does is it converts the existing tag database to a new SQL-based 64-bit um, operating system, which is compatible with uh, Factory Talk View SE. If you have existing alarms in your View32 system, we have an alarm modernization tool. It's available through our knowledge base, uh, but that would convert existing alarms to the Factory Talk alarm format. 
And then there are there is the uh, tag import and export wizard, which is used to uh, export existing HMI tag information for quick information, and then allows you to re-import or uh, not only export that information, but then import it back into uh, the new system. And then there is another utility that uh, is called the HMI tag to direct reference converter utility. And that will take the existing tag database references and uh, convert them into direct controller tag references. So that's uh, something that's important when using control logics and compact logics processors. And then some of the outcomes to expect from a modern factory talk VUSE system. Uh, one would be that it would then be aligned with modern operating system support. So not only are legacy VU32 systems typically tied to non-supported Microsoft operating systems, but because of that, that then induces the uh, or introduces the uh, ability to take advantage of different system security vulnerabilities. Um, but on the flip side, when leveraging you know, a modern OS, that operating system is patched, it's maintained, and it's enhanced uh, continuously by Microsoft. From a, a plant-wide visibility perspective, VOSE can really scale from a single dedicated terminal like Vue 32 was out to a truly centralized distributed system. And the advantage of that is that when you're leveraging a distributed system or distributed system, you've got uh, the ability to make changes to your HMI system while online. So you don't have to take the system down and, and uh, re-download to anything. In addition to that, factory talk alarms and events provide better uh, plant-wide alarming and we, we have a native pre-built alarming object and can also um, leverage some of the native alarming in the uh, control logics and compact logics processors that exist. And uh, next we have uh, the, the last, one of the other outcomes to expect from a modern USE system and is that and that is uh, taking advantage of new technologies like mobility, thin clients, and even uh, extending visualization out to augmented reality experiences. So hopefully you see, you know, this is the right move to make. There's a lot to take advantage of in a, a modern visualization platform. And one of the things we can do to support you commercially is just like with the hardware, take advantage of commercial incentive program uh, called Step Forward. So in this case, we would apply credit to purchase of a new uh, VUSE system by trading in existing VU32 software, as well as um, any non-Rockwell software, which also applies for Step Forward credit. So that brings us to a wrap on part one of this modernization mini series. Hopefully you found the content useful, uh, informational, and applicable to your processes or to your uh, environment today. Uh, again, you know, the goal of this, these sessions is to provide a high level overview. If you'd like more detail or a deeper dive, be a great opportunity to connect with your local distributor and we'd be happy to follow up uh, with you directly. We'll now open it up to uh, Q&A, and just as a reminder, our next session will be next week at the same time uh, on the same day, and we will be focused on networking fundamentals.